Good morning, everybody. That is That music means it's time for the MAP, the Mental Health and Addiction Podcast. Today's episode is called People Stepping Up, and we'll explain why that is the title in a minute. I'm Andy Bernstein, your modifi- modifier, moderator. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, got it. We have, as always, a great show planned, and we're going to hear from one of my all-time favorites, Paulie, the Miracle Man, Veneto. Um, who's going to tell us about a mission he has called Polly's Push, which we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, before we kick it off, let's meet the team. Who, uh, first of all, KPL, Kristen Perry Long, who are you? Tell us about yourself. Uh, today, I'm still me, and um, I am a family wellness uh, educator for Aware Recovery Care, which is an in home addiction treatment program. We're a 52 week program that comes to where you live. Are uh, you there now? I'm where I live right now. I know. Not forever. I know. I'm kidding you. I'm kidding Aren't you. Aren't you jealous? I'm in short sleeve. I know. I know. You're on location. You're on location. You're on assignment. Uh, all right. Who else is joining us? Who are you, Willie? Who are you? Guardians of the Galaxy, Defender of the Universe. Uh, Willie Drinkwater, educator for UMass Boston and the Addiction Counseling Education Program. And I, I also have a private practice where I work primarily with people with addiction and co-occurring disorders. And you're a professor? Yeah, I said that. You did. Okay, you're an adjunct yeah. professor. <laughs> I'll, draw, I'll talk a little slower. Adjunct professor. What does a yellow Boston. light mean? What does yes. adjunct mean? Adjunct Adju- to what? Adjunct means as as needed, as oh. needed. And so why not just so a per I'm, diem? I'm not a tenured, tenured. Uh, well, okay. I mean, basically, an, an adjunct is a per diem. Yeah, but Mr. I mean, Waters Opus, you're like opus. a teacher. The yeah. teacher, but they never mind. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've been per diem teaching the same courses for twelve for twelve years now. So I mean, it's pretty solid. At you UMass know, Boston, and you were part of the mm-hmm. Morning Big Mattress crew on. WBCN, The Rock of Boston, Charles Lacquadera, Billy West, Joanne Fitzgerald, Cody, and the whole whacked out crew. Eddie, Eddie Gordetsky? Uh, Eddie Gordetsky had left at that point. He went to New York and created a little show you may remember called Two and a Half Men. And then is now on, uh, now doing a show called Mom, of which is about. Yeah, he's the executive producer. Direct, I mean, he's the whole shebang there. Yeah, it's, it's about a mother and daughter who both uh, are, you know, in recovery from their addiction issues. And it's hilarious. You know, it's, it has the same type of humor as Two and a Half Men. You know, I, it's it in L- in I, uh, I, I love it because it's, I love it because it's like real. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, it's funny. They make it kind of light, but like when they're in their, their AA meetings and they're going through those life problems i mean they definitely put the upbeat spin yeah, on it you know, but it's you know, but it's real yeah yeah it's referred to as a dramedy it's dramatic and it's a comedy it's it's like you know it's like the old tv show mash was the first one to really do it where you know it'd be the sarcastic biting humor going the whole way through it. and then you would have this this like this one poignant moment that would just suck the breath out of you you know and mom does that too because there was an episode where the daughter got up uh, and she was she was talking, doing her, uh, you know, her drug and drunk log. And there was a guy in the audience that uh, a, a guy, you know, th- uh, at the meeting that had abused her years ago. And she she was she was able to get up there and look right at him and, you know, and say, you know, and I don't allow myself to be verbally or physically abused anymore. And the guy got up and walked out of the room. It was just one of those moments where it sucked the breath out of you. It was like, Wow, you know, good show. But Eddie Gordetsky, a Boston guy, and you know him, and Rhode Island, but Boston based with the radio. Yeah, got it. Um, and I am Andy Bernstein. I am a a media and uh, 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 guy who's been in the business for a long time. I created this show. Uh, well, Kristen Perry Long and Kimberly Walsh and I created this show back in December of two thousand nineteen, and. Uh, Prior to that, I had another show about addiction. So it's a, something, a subject that I'm very passionate about, mental health and addiction. So, um, you know, glad to be here. Uh, and, and you're also a modifier. Yes. You know, and, and you're I also a modifier. A big modifier. <laughs> I'd like to buy a vowel, please. Okay, yeah, you know. Uh, I don't know why it's pick on Andy Day today. <laughs> okay, so no, no, you're the setup. Gonna, you're the setup, gonna, man. We're yeah. not going to go into Wheel of Fortune, okay? Because you know where oh, I yeah. am, right? Sunny in 75, yeah, yeah, where yeah. everybody, you know. 
yeah. on the schedule, Wheel of Fortune. Mm-hmm. Yep, yeah. All right. We're good. So so you've been going to dinner about four o'clock in the afternoon, Chris? Yeah. And stuff. The early bird, <laughs> yeah. the early, God's waiting room. You're down in God's <laughs> Do you take yeah. AARP? Yeah. <laughs> or, or entertainment coupons? All right. Let me let me get my card out. Start taking your card out now. Right. Uh, it says if I buy one entree, I get the other one at an equal greater value. Yeah. Anyway, all right. Um, so Is there room for my walker at this table? <laughs> yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> all right, stop it. All right. Um, we have serious business to talk about. Um, okay. All right, People Stepping Up is the title of the show. And then we're going to get to your topic, Willie. But I want to just give a shout out to, shout out to Trey Anastasio from the band Fish. He um, used his foundation called the Divided Sky Foundation to opening a nonprofit facility to help treat people from alcoholism and addiction. It's in, he purchased a house in Ludlow, Vermont, and he uses the funds um, raised to create a, he did it from his virtual residency at the Beacon Theater in New York. Mm-hmm. And um, he had fans involved and they contributed 1.2 million during the event. So, um, so yeah, he started that and he said substance use disorders affect people from all walks of life. And the problem is intimately linked with isolation, whether that's isolation due to the pandemic or for any other reason. And, um, and so, uh, I, he's been sober 14 years himself and apparently Vermont ranks 11th in the country for overdoses. Um, they have no COVID, but they have overdoses. Well, Um, it's because it's Vermont is really bad because they don't have any resources. And the other big thing is, is everything comes down from Canada. So it's just, it's, it's a very, underprivileged when it comes to substance use. Um, and like, so when I was, oh gosh, years ago, when I, um, was, was going around and just trying to find and meet people in all the States, um, like methadone clinics, people have to drive like 30, 40, 50 minutes a day each way for a methadone clinic. Cause there's only like maybe one or two or maybe three clinics. And this is a wow. few years ago. So it could have changed. But, you know, like what barriers? There's so many barriers. Yeah. And it's and 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 weather, too. Yeah. And um, don't forget the weather. Um, what I love about this and I talk about this all the time. Here's the cool thing about what he's doing is um, he wants to provide multiple ways for people to enter and man- maintain recovery through individualized plans and programs. He's going to offer job training and workforce reintegration and provide education and certification in skills and trades. So, um, you know, he said that I was extremely lucky to have access to care and I know how important it is to be a part of the recovery community. And he's like, I'm grateful that we can help provide that opportunity for others. Uh, It's called the divided sky foundation and he's accepting donations. So I, uh, I applaud him. I think that's great using his platform, but also addressing job skills and, and things that, okay, well now I'm sober or now you're sober. What next? Right. How do I not face the same problems that I did before? And maybe it was money or lack of connection or purpose or whatever. So, uh, good stuff. Um, Willie, you uh, brought something to our attention regarding a an article um, called "A Catalyst for Post Pandemic Drug Addiction." Can you talk about it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of the. I mean, we're the longer we're in this pandemic and and the shutdown and stuff too. I mean, we're seeing a lot of people, you know, isolating. I mentioned in the past, you know, de- dealing with clients now with what's referred to as existential anxiety, where all of a sudden they start, you know, they're 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 alone with their own thoughts so much that they start thinking about their mortality and, oh my God, you know, how many more years do I have? Am I going to suddenly die? And this and that. And Generation Z is really getting affected by it, according to, to the article. You know, 18 to 22 year olds are really experiencing loneliness. And, you know, it's okay to be alone so long as you don't feel lonely. Loneliness, you know, leads into depression. People can end up with anxiety. And then, you know, loneliness factor can drive people right down the road to suicide. So, I mean, you know, it's, yeah. it's, you know, and the, the biggest problem that I'm having now, and I'm sure, sure that uh, Chris can, can, can talk about it too. I mean, I'm getting, 
you know, three to five referrals a week that I can't even touch, you know, and in the beginning of the pandemic, I was referring them to clients that, you know, had, had, had openings. But at this point in time, it's like most of my, I mean, referring to colleagues, you know, most, you know, all of my colleagues at this point that I was referring out to, I mean, they're full now too. I mean, so there's a real crunch out there, you know, as far as not being able to get, uh, you know, therapy. So what, what do you do about it? Because I'm, uh, you know, the article has, um, first of all, where did you find such article? There's a publication online. It's called The Fix and it's Addiction and Recovery right. News. And they've got, they have a lot of great articles. Like once in a while, I'll find a really interesting one and I'll post it onto LinkedIn. And then, you know, and then the numbers just go off the charts. Like, like people that, that are, you know, looking at them and stuff at the articles that I post. And stuff. Um, which, okay. which, which, by the way, if you want to keep your name out on LinkedIn, that's a great way to do it. Uh, you know, is you, is you find an interesting an article and you post it to all of LinkedIn and stuff. I mean, you that's are the king of LinkedIn anyway. Um, so mm-hmm. I'm just kidding. The dire, so it's dire mental health, a catalyst for post pandemic addiction. Mm-hmm. And some of the things that they cover, um, and again, you can find it on the fix.com, but some of the things they cover is about, um, creating strategies around it. So, um, you know, they're saying that, you know, some of the factors around this is biology, Mm -hmm. uh, the environment, um, development and, um, and loneliness is one of the biggest things. So, I mean, Chris, in your opinion, what can you do? How do you, how do you tackle loneliness? I mean, it's such a big problem. I mean, what do you think? How could you, you know? I mean, I think like, you know, I think what's happening is now, and we've, we've been saying this for a while is, you know, people are home and they're isolated and they sit behind a computer. Right. And right. what do you get out of that? Right. I mean, yeah, it's nice and it's funny and we can joke and we know each other, but when you're in early recovery, like that human connection is, is so important for uh, recovery. It, it gives people purpose. Like, you know, you want to feel good. You want to look good. You want to have a conversation nine times out of 10, they share, you know, you got a butt, you got a light, it creates conversation. It creates that. So what do we do about it? I mean, I don't know because like, I mean, I know the world's starting to open up and, um, I mean, I think <laughs> it's great that we're opening up. I just hope that we do it safely so that we don't have to shut down again because, if we have to shut down again, that's just going to be horrific. Um, And I think the other big thing that's happening, and I don't know, Willie, if you're seeing this is, you know, as the world is starting to open back up and people are going back to work and stuff, uh, the realization that their disease is more out of control than they ever thought, because now they're having to go into the office a few days a week. And, you know, they can't take that drink or drug in between meetings and they're going to work and, and they're starting to feel those withdrawal symptoms. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been a year of relapse, that's for sure, you know, and yeah. stuff. And especially, I mean, it was, you know, we're, we're going back to last year and stuff. When those first checks came out, you know, if you weren't solid in your recovery, I mean, that money just flew out the window. I mean, the drug dealers were, you know, they were extremely happy when those checks were coming out because they were you know, sucking up so much of that money. I mean, it was crazy. You know, if you were someone in early recovery and you, and you had any reservation at all about continuing the recovery, I mean, stimulus check was just, that just blew them up and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I've i done so many referrals to detox and inpatient over the last year. Yeah, the last year was, was probably the most referrals I did to detox and inpatient in my career so far, you know, of the clients that I had. Yeah, we do that too. We get people that are super acute, you know, and they come out of detox. I'm super and acute. Us. Yeah, you're super cute. Thank you. You know, that's because you're a modifier. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Call they're back. Like, they're like really, you know, they've been in and out of in and out of in and out yeah. of detox, and you you're putting somebody back into uh, an environment that is not a healthy environment because yeah. we all know if nothing changes, nothing changes. I mean, we're just stuck all that's going to happen is that this, this wheel that we're on, it's just going to yeah. get a little bit bigger. And the you know what would, you, you know be- what, you, you know what, what, what would be an interesting topic too, for, you know, a future show and stuff is we know that mandated treatment can work from, for many people. Well, if, you know, if we get people that keep going into detox, like, you know, two, three, four times a month, uh, you know, 
Couldn't we mandate them to treatment? I know, I know the ACLU would probably be all over that in a heartbeat. You're taking away their, their freedom and their rights. But, you know, you know, we as a society, we're paying not only not only financially, but we're paying emotionally and, and you know, we're, we're, we're paying mentally for these people that keep going back in over and over again. So, you know, if mandated treatment works, you know, then, you know, say you have, you know, if you have go to detox four times within a year, then. Okay, the next step is when you need the detox again, it's mandated. You're going to be gone for, you know, for 90 days, you know, and yeah. stuff. But but again, the civil libertarians, they would jump all over that, you know. No, but, it'll never. Unfortunately, we know that what works yeah. and, you yeah. know, yeah. but it unfortunately, um, it'll never, it'll never happen. We can't. I mean, that's why we have Section 35 and, you know, yeah. Section 12 in Massachusetts. Yeah. But even those, you know, what are they getting in the in mass? Yeah, yeah. Are they getting in yeah. And when you can see getting workbooks, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. And section thirty-five is for thirty days when, you know, Harvard's pointed out that you don't see a significant drop in relapse rates until someone has a hundred days of continuous treatment. But the most that we're willing to pay for is thirty day, which however we keep paying the thirty day over and over again. So I mean if you if we paid for the hundred initially, the hundred days of treatment. Uh, if that if that if that would cause fewer people needing to go into detox, wouldn't we actually be saving money? I mean, yeah, right. So. You would think that that's what we would want to be doing. Hmm. Let me pose a question: um, as as people start to get back into, you know, assuming everything goes according to plan and everybody's vaccinated, hmm. don't you see that we're going to have a big hang after effects? Because people are not, you know, people are have been under lockdown for a long time. Oh yeah, they could go wild. You know, I right. mean, you, you you could see everybody just saying, "Ah, we're back again. We're alive." You know. What about depression though. Like yeah. like okay, now mm. what? Now what? Now I've, you know, now I've had to deal with my, you know, almost being in 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 lockdown like and have being alone with my own thoughts and over a period of time, mm-hmm. um it's like now I'm re-entering. I can't look at the world the same. Can you? Can you yeah, yeah. With, with Chris brought up a great point before too, you know, so now you're going to start going into work. And if you were, if you were slipping at home over the course of the pandemic, so to speak, if you were drinking and drugging at home, you know, just, you know, because you could do it, you could do your work on zoom and you could look, you know, you, you, you could fake it more or less, you know, in so fake far as, it. yeah, fake it to make it. But yeah, I mean, you know, so what, what's going to happen if you do go back into the office again, although I know a lot of businesses now are really, they're reevaluating how much time people really need to go into the office. You know, I mean, yeah, I, know, just, I know we as therapists, you know, I mean, a lot of therapists, I, you know, friends and stuff they're they're, they're all saying, you know, they, they've gotten really acclimated to doing the teletherapy. I mean, I was leaving Beverly three, four nights a week, seven 30, eight o'clock at night, eight 30. And it's like, you know, a lot of us are thinking in terms of we'll keep our offices. We'll do, you know, new admissions, you know, new people coming into our practice, that initial assessment we'll do on our office, but we'll do it in morning hours. And then, you know, basically go in the office two or three days a week, not not four or five, you know, just morning hours. And if you want therapy after, say, two in the afternoon, it's going to have to be teletherapy because, you know, I want to be home, you know, and stuff. So. So I just think it's re- I I just think it's really interesting, and this is actually the only thing I could kind of compare it to in a sense is nine eleven in the sense that you're coming, um, you know, people people vacated cities, they got out, you know, there was a lot of like a lot of tragedy. It's like people stopped looking at the world the same way. It really impacted a lot of people. I just think it's going to have impacts where you start to question, what's it all about, Alfie? Right. Like what what is for me? Like, yeah, and it's yeah. And it's an unstable country right now at the present time. I mean, you know, no one knows what's going to happen. I mean, my, my you know, the biggest thing that I'm anticipating is my wife being able to pick up her dual citizenship for Canada. You know, it's like I'm out of here. But anyway, no, I mean, you know, I can do teletherapy from Nova Scotia and stuff because my clients are in Massachusetts. My license is in Massachusetts. Your life changed as after this. Right. Uh, uh, Paulie is we're going to hear from our guests. But yeah. I was just let me close this thought. Um, um, what was I going to say? Um, you, you know, uh, I don't remember. Life, life changing. I was talking oh, about. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah, you were saying like you've had an evaluation. You both have, you know, kind of looking at life differently now. You look well, at yeah. that. Of course. Like it's yeah, a no-brainer. Yeah, yeah, How can yeah, you yeah, not? Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, especially I'm on the back nine, as they say, you know, I mean, I'm 65. I know I'm at my midlife. I'll end up 130, but you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm totally reevaluating things, things now and stuff, you know, I mean, uh, I don't ever want to fully retire. I always told my wife, I'm going to start drinking again as soon as I retire. And she goes, when do you, when are you going to retire? I said, I don't plan on, on retiring ever. Cause I can always be teaching a few courses or seeing a few clients. So right. it doesn't oh, make, you're gonna be that's like how the old smelly, Dry. Gonna be gonna be Mel Brooks at ninety two, and I'm still gonna be doing right. my my thing. You know, whether you're homeless or you're a professor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You went Harvard. Yeah, That's a big joke at Harvard. Is that a homeless person or is that a Harvard a, professor yeah. or a professor? All right, let's bring in Polly Polly V Polly Veneto, the Miracle Man, one of my all time favorites. He um, he's he's a an interesting character. And he's got a really cool mission that he's doing right now. Uh, speaking in 9-11. Mike, can we send him? Can we let him in? Be coming in. Here he is. Coming in hot. There he is. The man, the legend. Where is he? I see him. I don't see him. I do. Hold on. Where's I Paul? see him. He's right in the middle of my screen. Hey. Boy, boy. There he is. What's going on, my brother? Uh, I'm sitting there cooking a T-bone steak. No, you're not. Are I you? Am. I just finished <laughs> uh, my push, so uh, now I'm going to have a T-bone steak, and I'm going back out to hit the pavement. Yeah. So, all right. So, you got a cool thing. First of all, you're uh, you're one of the uh, the all time greats. You are a miracle. Um, uh, that was. A, can you give us a little overview about yourself? You've been on our show before, yeah. but I w- want to hear about Polly's push, but just give a little context before we dive into that. Um, what do you mean? A little, uh, what like about who, my, who are you? Give it a little of your story. Um, well, obviously I'm in recovery. Um, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm almost coming apart at the seams that the, how things have happened in my life since I've got sober again. I, um, you know, for almost 20 years after 9-11, that was something that internally tortured me. And, um, and even since I got sober, it just hasn't stopped with, to the fact that, you know, I was determined to get my fellow crew members recognized for the heroics they did that day. It you were a flight attendant. You were a flight attendant. That's what I wanted you to kind of tell. Oh, them, okay. Yeah. Give the contact. Uh, so I, I, uh, I was a flight attendant for five airlines. The last airline I went to work for was United. And so it's just the way my career worked out. I'm grateful it did. I worked for Charter Airlines, and and in that industry, everybody wants to work for a major. And um, so I was trained by five different airlines, which is very unusual. So um, I, I'm so fortunate. That, you know, for that experience. And uh, so um, what happened when I was with United, uh, I went to work for United in 97, was based in Chicago. And then I transferred to Boston. And uh, in 97, I transferred to Boston after six months out in Chicago. And um, and I was very fortunate in, in being new at United, and Boston was a small base. And to hold transcon flying, they call it, you know, one flight across the country with a long layover on the West Coast, you know, and then one flight back, that usually goes senior. You need to be with the company a lot of years. I was fortunate that I was able to hold that stuff pretty much right off the bat and uh, that type of flying. And, and I enjoyed that flying, transcon flying, because you know, I'd rollerblade out in L.A. and Venice Beach and, you know, things, were, you know, it was beautiful. My life, you know, I was sober. Um, it was sober 10 years. And uh, so, as we, as we all know, what happened on 9 11, and uh, that was my route, Boston to LA, uh, Flight 175. I just came in off it, and, uh, and the, uh, the plane was heading back to LA, and that's the second one, Flight 175, they hit the towers. So I ended up relapsing. I was a physical flight attendant. I was known for it. I was always, you know, when I, you know, for years on them charter flights. I mean, the serving meals. I was bending over all the time. I, I mean, I, I always helped with bags, and they were telling me not to do it. 
But I mean, you know, I mean, I was a physical guy. I played sports in high school and stuff. So it didn't bother me. But eventually the wear and tear, I didn't realize what was happening. Hold on, I got to shut this steak off. <laughs> <laughs> it's not medium rare anymore. <laughs> okay, so what happened um, after 9-11, a doctor prescribed me a pain medication, which I thought was a muscle. You know, I never heard of it. It was called Norco. And I never heard of Norco. If he said, if he said here's a Percocet, I would have known. You know, I mean, nothing about opiates. So what happened to me was I ended up eating those things, and you know, right after 9/11. And so the the trauma, of that whole thing, little did I realize I was being numbed out. I wasn't getting the real effect of what happened that day. I mean, I was, I was in shock, but I was, you know, and all of a sudden I built up a tolerance. I was, you know, it, it, it seemed, whatever he gave me seemed to work. You know what I mean? I wasn't in pain or whatever, and and you know, as we all know in recovery, the progression of that and. Uh, mm. It just was horrible. So I lasted 10 more years on the aircraft flying. And I don't want to go into any of that stuff because, you know, I, there, are time, there is a time for that to, to really get into that stuff. I get into the stories and all that. That's really not important with me today because of what's going on in my life today. And, uh, and because of you guys, uh, Andy, my friend Kevin, Kelly, uh, people in recovery, you know, the message that, that's going to be because of what I've been able to, I've been fortunate to get sober again and to, uh, 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 like I'm ecstatic over uh, all I wanted. All I wanted was the public and the crew members' families to understand, understand the, the, how, how, you know, what those crew members did that day, under those circumstances, you can ask anybody in the military or anybody under those circumstances, without being trained as combat fighters or whatever, to, to go, have gone through what they went through with the viciousness of that went on up there, and to be able to make phone calls to tell us on the ground what was going on up there is mind-boggling. One guy, ten only flying for ten months, flying for ten months, and you know, flight attendant stabbed, master's throat slit, pilot's throat slit, and this kid had the whatever to make a call under those circumstances. Hmm. Uh, and, and there's plenty of those stories that went on up there. It's just mind-boggling to me. All the training I've had, I couldn't even imagine. I couldn't even imagine. But I, I felt like they never really were recognized. They were never recognized for what they did. You know, most flight attendants, when you think about it, you know, most majority of people out there, you know, they serve you the drinks or whatever they do. But up at that altitude, you can't call a fire department. You can't call the police, whatever. You, you got uh, sometimes two or 300 people on an airplane and anything can happen at any moment or whatever. And you got to pull it together. Period. There's no, there's no question. We'll do it later, or whatever. You gotta, you know. And sometimes these crew members don't know each other. They're from different cities and work different. But no matter what, you gotta put it together. So what happened that day was something that's never happened in the world. It was just like it was just unbelievable. So for me personally, every year the anniversary would come up, I'd be fueled with anger. You know, I'd be fueled. It was burning me up. I don't know how I lasted 10 years. So I was coming up on the 10 year anniversary. And, uh, and at this point, I'm on full blown addiction. Flying, and I, and I, I know I, I got to do something, the 10 year anniversary. I got to do something. And I started to try to organize a 10 year anniversary memorial concert at City Hall Plaza. And uh, like a week before, uh, two weeks before 9-11, on the anniversary, 10-year anniversary, my whole career, it all came crashing down. That's when, and it never, I, I ended up in treatment. I was in treatment when that anniversary, that I never got that thing set up on time. And I was in treatment. That started my, myself coming back into my, you know, in the recovery. I, my career went down, I lost my career, da, 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 the whole, all the story of what addiction does to all of us. So, 
what's happening today is it's crazy. You know, it's just crazy to me that all I had to do was show up at this recovery day. I just had to get myself there. And uh, and and it's true what you, we all hear. Like, I would have never imagined in a million years that I would live or survived to be able to do what I, I'm going to be able to be doing. And with the help of people that came into my life because I'm sober, um, I want them to recognize and I'm able to do that today. I'm able to do something that's being, it's getting blown just the way I wanted to without me having to do anything, but just get up in the morning, ask for help and do the best I can today. And it's all happened. It's crazy. Like a few <laughs> months back, what happened, a friend of mine's younger brother served in um, Afghanistan. And all of a sudden, I get a box in the mail one day. I come home. And I open it up, and it's an American flag. I'm gonna. Can I get it and show it to you sure. so you can see yeah. it? Yeah, sure. Uh, Turn over the steak while you're. Uh... Yeah, the hell that I get another one. Then I'll cook. So this box shows up, right? And I pull this out, and it's American flag folded, right? Mm. So, and there's a note inside it. Oh, oh, God, I get so emotional. Uh, Paul, I know how passionate you are about 9-11. I had this fl flag flown over Air Base Shindag, Afghanistan on September 11th, 2011, when I was deployed. And really would like you to have it. And no, we put, put it in their face. And then he says, as a sir, Certificate, certified card underneath the cardboard, and it's you know it's uh, I don't know a military thing. You know what I mean? I don't know if you can see it. Hmm. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. They, they, they flew it over the base. Uh, the the air, air, air guys at the base or what? I flew it over on purpose just to throw it in the Afghan's face or whatever. I, I don't know, but. All of a sudden, I, I was like, you know, this kid here, he's sure he, and he's giving me the flag. So anyways, that all of a sudden, the light went on that it's time. And um, hmm. so, I don't know, I think I mentioned to Andy one time what I was planning on doing. It was in the back of my mind that... Uh, I thought it was not real. I thought you were kidding. Oh, no, no. I knew that, I knew that, you know, when the time came, things would come into place, and it just... It hasn't, it's just unbelievable. So, you know, I could, I could do something to get these guys recognized. I could put on a concert. I could do something. I got fit, two brothers in bands. They offer, you know, all that stuff. But I know these crew members' families are all over the country. In local news, they might not see something. Where it's needed to be something national. It just did. So without me doing anything, I decided, you know, I'm going to push a beverage cart to New York City from Logan Airport, Boston, from the gate that they left out of. That's and, you know, I've been thinking about this for about four years. Hmm. And I knew this is the time. So I started, you know, October, I started walking. I'm 62 years, I'll be 62 Monday. I'm no pro athlete, but I'll tell you, I know that if I do something, I can do something, I'm able to do something to do this with the 20th anniversary coming up. So I started in October, walking, 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 walking. I, I, then I got sick for a week and a half, I stopped. And then uh, I knew it, I, I told myself in March, when March comes, I'm kicking it in. And March 1st came and uh, I decided it's time to start pushing the beverage. Oh, so I'm, I go into the airport, I had to make a delivery at American about two or three months ago. And I asked the guys, you know, guys got a beverage cart laying, laying around here? And, and he goes, no, no, we don't hold those things. Even if we had it, we couldn't give it to you. We couldn't get, let you take it off the property. So I said, all right, I'm pulling out of the American uh, terminal area, and I see the catering company. I go over to the catering company. And I pull in, and there's a guy standing out front smoking. And I walk up to him. I said, I don't know who I speak to, but who do I talk to about getting a beverage cart? And he looks at me like I got three heads, right? 
<laughs> and I, I said, Bebe, he goes, what do you want a Bebbage cap on? And I said, well, I'm on a train to push it to New York for the 20th anniversary. He goes, what? He goes, come with me. You, get, you need a key card to get in. He brings me upstairs to the offices in this catering company. And he goes, here, wait right here. I'm in the lobby. And I see him go through a door. And then the door opens. I hear him tell this guy, this black spider attendant's going to let him. And all of a sudden, he goes, hey, come in here. And I come walking in. He rolls the card over to me. He hands it to me. He goes, that's yours. Oh, that's awesome. I, I left there. I was I couldn't believe it. I knew now the things are starting to come together. So, anyways, March first, I start pushing for the first time, and I'm on Pope John Paul Park on a what was it Saturday morning? Yeah, Saturday morning I was pushing it, and then Sunday morning I'm pushing it. And as I did, you did you read that that story the guy wrote? It was crazy. Yeah. Some guy sitting on a bench, and he says, uh. He, he shrugged his shoulders as I'm going by. And I just, it sounds like, like, in other words, what the hell are you doing? You know what I mean? Right. So I finally stopped and took my headphone off. And I went to him real quick. And said, ah, I'm training. I want to push this thing to New York. for the He goes, what? He jumps up. He goes, what is that thing? I said, it's a beverage guy. He goes, what is a beverage guy? I said, on an airplane, you don't find it there. And he starts circling around the thing. You couldn't believe it. He said, really? You're going to do all the way to New York? He goes, can I take a picture of you? I said, sure. I don't care. So he takes my picture. Off I go, I'm pushing it about a five minutes later I'm on my way back, and he comes walking towards me, right? And he says, stops me, and he, I take my headphones off. He goes, what's your name? He asked me my name. And he goes, you mind if I put this on social media? I said, I don't care. I said, I asked him his name. So off I go. So then I, when I finish, I get in my car, and I'm trying to remember that. I'm thinking, what's this guy's name again? And I finally remember his name, and I looked him up on Facebook, and Oh my God, he already had this thing printed up. And all of a sudden, my phone starts blowing up. And that, <laughs> the Milton newspaper calls me. They want to do a, a story on it. And uh, a, a lady in Vegas is caught, contacting me. You know, how do I donate? And uh, I was just so overwhelmed. I was out of, I couldn't, I was just, you know, I couldn't believe it. The second day, I pushed the cart. So, long story short, Kelly got involved and she got, uh, when I started in October, me, Kelly, and um, Becca, Becca uh, Peasy, who ran the okay, marathon. Yeah, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's me, Kelly, and Becca put this, started putting this thing together. And uh, now, you know, I, I, I wanted, of course, a media coverage, but the way it turned out was beautiful that this guy wrote this thing. It wasn't, you know, whatever. Because right off the bat, a thousand people shared it, and who knows where it went. But I'm being contacted by people. So I'm getting overwhelmed. How, you know, I'm worried about the logistics. And all so finally, it's all ironed out. And, uh, Becca yeah. PZ, let, let, yeah. me, let, let me just interrupt. Becca PZ has run uh, how many? Seven marathons, seven marathons on seven continents? Seven yeah. marathons in seven days and seven continents. She's won it right. twice. She's from Belmont. She's the greatest. Anyway. Um, so... As of yesterday, uh, I got the email from uh, Kelly. Uh, Compel Pictures is going to do the whole thing, documentary about it from beginning to end, the whole web thing, build a website, everything, to so it spreads. Out. It's, it's crazy. So what? What? How many miles is it? Uh, right at the beginning, I, I. I mapped it on Google Maps. I came up with 220. But we've, we've gotten various numbers I, I have from different people. The Becker's company, they're going to, I wanted, you know, my sister was going to do it. Uh, Becker's going to handle all that. She knows how to do it. You know, she's got the car, you know, the people that know how to. So I'm guaranteed there's not going to be any, you know, uh, you know, I'm running to a bridge where I can't go or something. You know, it's all going to be mapped out, right? Hmm. And then, then I'll know the exact distance total. It's somewhere around 220 to something depending on the route, you know what I mean? So all that st all those questions I asked all the time and I can't answer them until this website's up, I'll answer them all. And the website should be up next week. And so what are you going to do? So you're going to try to, so can people donate? Like, yeah, what is the money going to? Well, what I, but, uh, see, th this is this is my suggestion and I hope it, uh, every, you know, I haven't had a problem, at, like everything in my mind, they were, it's working out, which I, I'm not fighting over. How, you know, I, I want this thing all the way up until that, the day I come into Ground Zero to be about these crew members. Really not about me. I don't want that. After the fact, then I don't care about telling my story or whatever. 
but I don't want any focus taken away from what this thing is about. It's about them. That's it. So, and it's, you know, I understand it can be, you know, I turn my life around to do this and maybe a little bit snippet, but I don't want anything to take away from what the focus really should be on, what these people did. Yes. So the, the, fu the funding for it, you know, you have, you know, each one of us have a, uh, a, a reason why we give to certain charity, cancer society, or muscular dystrophy, everybody, every family has their own thing. So my idea was, why don't we do this? Anybody that wants to donate to help me fu to fund this thing, if, say, Andy, you give $20 to a cancer society. Willie gives $100 to muscular dystrophy. Coca-Cola gives $200,000 for this. This one gives two for that. But when you donate, you put in what your foundation you want, whatever to go in. Once the, the event is paid off, whatever expenses are, the total sum of the money total gets equally distributed to every one of them, every one of those foundations. So it's not, it spreads even wider. And, and the reason I came up with that is because that's what I, I believe, first of all, these crew members, that's the type of people they were. They were, I mean, they were the best people I ever worked with, the flight attendants, they were just always giving, they were that type of people. And uh, with what's going on in this world and country today, we, it's got to be spread. They, they want to spread the, 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 the vision that's happened. That's my own thought about it. So I feel like the foundation should go to everybody. Well, because every family's got a need for what they want or, or feel. Or, you know, I don't want to just specifically, you know, I've gotten so many since that. Why don't you just do the 9 11 fund? Why don't you just do this fund? You know, and I understand that. I, I listen to it all, but I really believe it's got to spread. It's got to spend. So, in other words, if you donate twenty dollars, you could end up getting five hundred to your one because it's equally distributed got it. to everybody. So, no matter how much you put in, you know, so you just don't know. You know what I mean? And someone that puts a dollar in, you know what I mean, could get five hundred going to that cause. You know what I mean? What? So I, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask you what's the website address when? Well, that, that'll be up. It's right now, the tentative name is Paulie's Push. Uh, that'll be the name. I don't know what the, you know, as a matter of fact, Monday is when I meet with him. And the timeline's all set. He's got a lot set up. When that goes up, and you know, the, the, he'll add to it the, whatever he, those people do. I know nothing about that. I, I, you know what I mean? All, all I want to focus on is being able to do this thing. You know what I mean? Right. I just, I, I don't know how many miles I got to do a day. I don't want to start out and tell them, hey, listen, I need to take a nap. You know what I mean? Uh, whatever. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? So, um, I mean, I don't care what I got to do. I mean, I will crawl to do this thing. Well, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. Oh, well, I'll no do doubt. it. it. You know, no it's doubt. like a perfect storm. The whole thing happened. It's a perfect storm. So, to go into the recovery part, after the, oh, so this guy wants to do a, a documentary, he says, and, you know, about the whole thing. You know, that's when the recovery is going to come in. A documentary to go to Sundance next year. So I don't know anything about that. I don't care about that. I don't care. Just get me through this and do what the frig you want, as far as I'm concerned. You know what I mean? Right. Just let me just keep the vision on what I'm, my vision of what it should be about. So I'm just excited that it's even happening, that people are getting involved and doing that stuff. You know what I mean? It's I love crazy. it. I love it. It's getting at uh, Chris, go ahead. How do we get involved, Polly, besides donating? How can we help you? Uh, well, well, I think on the website, that'll be, I mean, you know, I know that there's so many logistics with it. You know, they'll have to, right now, they'll have to be a, um, a pace car, which is probably going to be an RV. I got a friend that volunteered to do that. So there's a bathroom in it or whatever, you know what I mean? So I mean, once, the, once the map is up of where I'm going, I've already been contacted by pe people in different states. Where are you going to be on this day? We want to walk with you. And all that stuff will fall into place once that website's up there. People will know the information. You know, it's just, it's, it's, this is helpful to be able to tell you guys. So you can tell other people, you know what I mean? And that's right now. Once that website, because my, my phone doesn't stop. Like tomorrow I get the newspaper lady from Milton. And I'm, you know, I'm overwhelmed. I, I just don't want to drink today, you know what I mean? I, I just want to walk. You know? I just, just want to eat my steak, to be honest with you. But, so, I mean, it's it's a gift of sobriety. I never thought I would be able to do 
what really is important to my life. That's it's not the monkey off my back. It's I believe, I believe, I I believe that it was this was supposed to happen the way it's supposed to happen. I, you know, I just believe it was supposed. To, and you know something? Ever since I've been sober again, that's this is just the icing on the cake. There's been all along the way. There's a lot of those stories, but this is like this is a, it's all it's the ultimate to me. So I know that getting sober again in the late fifties is a message to somebody that's sitting in a detox now or in a jail cell after relapse. I know that, but we know that, you know what I mean? We know that in recovery, but the rest of the world right now, I want them to know about these crew members. That's all I want. And, and I know that's important. And I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful that I'm able to finally, because I stayed sober at the end of time, to do this. Well, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, on that flight was, um, yeah. Mark Bavis, yeah, yeah. Bavis found a uh, Bavis. Yeah. It was a uh, a scout for the LA Kings as well as yeah. Ace Bailey, who was also yeah. a scout. And both of their organizations actually had events this year, and they had to cancel both of them and last yeah. year. So they should be, um, you know. So they were both on that flight. So um, you know, yeah, I, I met the Bavis family last year and the year before at the nine eleven memorial in Boston, and. Uh, it was pretty pretty moving because they wanted to hear a lot from me, and I was, uh, you know, it was it was almost tough because like some of the sisters were like, "Wow, you know, they didn't all these years," and I, you know, I didn't know if it was appropriate from what I, not that I knew, you know, but but I knew some stuff that it, you know, that went on, and and you know, I mean, this is from what I've heard and you know, from different people through the years in the industry, you know, while I was flying and I don't know, you know, I was, what condition I was under when I heard that stuff, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I heard that I, I, I even questioned, was that what I heard? You know, I mean, because I wasn't under the right night, but I know that if you look at flight 175, it's churning and almost misses the building. And that's because they were trying to take that cockpit back. They were fighting at the cockpit door, trying to get the cockpit back. And when they're fighting, so a lot, and that really wasn't publicized. But if you look at the plane, you see it banking. It was just a, it was just a, 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 a horror show up there. You know, what I mean, once they, whatever. I don't like to get into it, but so there's stuff like that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is, uh, I know a couple of years ago you actually headed down to uh, 9/11. It was your first time back there. Yeah. And. Yeah. Was that a part of the reason that you can do this now is because you kind of had that uh, opportunity to, um, you know, some healing for you when you were down there, uh, you know, some have a cathartic, you know, being very cathartic for you. Did that allow you to do, move forward with this project? Oh, I think had you not been able to do that, would you be able to do this today? You know, I, that was that was just part of my recovery. That was a part of my early recovery. That's, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, I'll be six years sober on 9-11 when I put, when I push that card in there. 9-11, I'll be six years sober. That's what the anniversary is. Okay. So, is it your goal to arrive on 9-11? On 9-11. I'm going to come in there on 9-11. So. Um, That's awesome. You know, the, the, um, you know it's, and, and things have changed it's like developing like out of control, like, which is good, a good thing, you know what I mean? But it's, for me, I gotta be, I'm getting overwhelmed with it. And and now that this guy is on board, I don't have to worry about the, all that technical stuff and all that, because my mind was filled with it. How am I, you know, how am I gonna, I gotta talk to uh, JetBlue to let me leave off that gate, C-19. That's where United 75 left. So Massport and all that stuff, but Becker's PZ, he's got all those contacts, he's gonna handle that, you don't worry about it. No, 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 you know, because you got to go through the tunnel and come out of the airport. Uh, all that stuff. It was just, uh, you know, my head was just spinning. So, you know, it's it's it really is, it's really going to be a, uh, a. I think it's a good thing for everybody. It really is. It's It's you know, if you read some of the stuff people wrote on that, what that guy posted, if you yep. want to hit page, it's amazing. Like it's, you know, I'm glad it's an uplifting story. You know, what I mean, I'm glad it is. I mean, but I still that. want it's what's that? We need that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think because everybody, no matter who you are, was affected by this thing. You know, and the, even people that are, 
you know, 20 years old that was just born when it happened. Their, fa their parents were affected by it, whatever. It's just, you know, so at, at this time, I think it's a, you know, it'll be something, hope hopefully everybody gets something out of it. You know what I mean? I just know that I'm just grateful that I'm able to, you know, and of course it's all because I'm sober. I, and, and no question about that. You're getting you out know? of, you're doing something for somebody else. You're doing, it's a good, good service work. It's uh it's it's great. You know we're pulling for you, my friend. Yeah, I know that. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, you know, Andy. Anytime you ask me, uh, anybody asks me, uh, that that's what I was taught years ago. You know, you always have your hand out for somebody, whatever, and and, and you've always done that for me. Uh, it's just that's that's how this thing works. I'm just so grateful. But uh, I'm so you know, of course, in my mind, can I do this thing? You know, <laughs> you can do it. You know, it's, it's, it's a miracle. You know, Oh yeah, I, 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 I've already kicked it up more than I thought I would. You know what I mean? So, I, oh look at this! I get Your Facebook that, page. The people who want to you see this thing. Oh wow! Yeah. This is this is a training schedule someone made for me. Hmm. <laughs> you know That's, crazy. That's crazy. Hey, Polly, do you have somebody painting your cart for you? See, that, that's another question. So. People have offered um, to do different da, 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 and that's why I'm grateful that the, I get the full say in it, and I appreciate it. I listen to everybody that what they want to say, but I've, I've come down with the what I'm. See, I don't want this. I don't want it to be some big lottie -de cat go. You know what I mean? With painting and that. I want it basic. What the point is? So tentatively, my idea is I'm going to have a set of flight attendant wings, big wings on the side of the cot hmm. above it will be united and american emblems and below will be the four flight numbers and when they hit the towers in the shanksville or whatever that's it so if, if, if the beverage cart is the whole idea you know i mean i have to I, I, of course i've heard why don't you put their pictures on there why don't you do this you know i mean no american flag is what i was thinking with the yeah. towers with all that information the wavy flag hmm. but that's just well, yeah. yeah it's just i wanted basic people um uh, it's just a, uh, there were 25 flight attendants, there were eight pilots, and there were, you know, I mean, I, I could go on and on and on. There were, a, a, there were a couple of customer service agents for United on board. You know, I don't want to leave anybody out. Bob Sweeney, you know, Bob Sweeney from the Bruins, uh, his sister in law, I guess, was on there. Yeah, she was on American, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah from the Bruins, who played for the Bruins, his, uh, yeah, so it, 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 it matter of fact that that skate thing with Kevin, yeah. I was talking to him about I couldn't believe I didn't know that. I couldn't believe it. While uh, I was on the eighth skating with him, you told me. It's it's crazy. So um all right, well thank you very much for coming on at such short Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Anytime, you know that. Short notice and we'll um we I just yeah, whatever you can do to uh Of course yeah, to spread it out or whatever. Know that. Once we get the website, we will, uh, mm -hmm. we will, uh, we'll get it out there and we'll try to help any way we can. You know, I appreciate it. thanks guys. All right. Yeah, Paulie, yeah, good to see you. Paulie. Good to see you. Uh, I'm going to go eat my steak. Do you mind? No, please go. Goodbye. <laughs> it's been well done at this point. Is it, is it's it well done? It's rubber. Go eat it's, steak. it's like shoe leather, right? All right. Goodbye. All right. See you later. See you, Paul. <laughs> All right, Paul. Bye. Bye. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. That's our show for. <laughs> wow. the best. Is he not the best? That would be fun to watch. We we'll yeah no. That. So in our Absolutely. old radio show, so in our old radio show, he came in one day, and he was wearing a, a uh, he he went and changed and he put a suit on, and he put a oh. suit on. Do you remember that? Oh yeah, I remember that. Oh, you're there. <laughs> I took my screen off, so you don't. I don't want to be embarrassed with this little steak. All right. Anyway, that's our show for the week. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, to, to Mike, thanks to Mike Weber, at Mission Control, who deals with this our crazy bunch every week, and we really appreciate all all his uh, his hard work and helping us keep our uh, our little. Uh, a little program together here and uh i'm gonna make you a t-shirt andy that says the model five <laughs> love that you've been thinking about that the whole show i have yeah the model i know five. i know 
There's the equalizer, and then there's Andy, the modifier. The modifier. The modifier. The modifier. Yeah, Polly. I meant to tell you, on my Facebook page, you'll see that they, uh, 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 somebody put up the last time I was on your show, and they put the whole thing on. They clicked it on and said, that's my father's friend. And uh, I couldn't believe it. If you, you know, when I posted a, what the guy put, people wrote some stuff, and one of my friend's daughters saw it, and so she posted the show up. Oh, good. Oh, cool. Yeah. Like that. Please post it, and we're, we're behind you, and we're going to track your progress as we wrap up our uh our 60 what second episode yeah. crazy Woo-hoo. right all right well that's oh. our show for the week <laughs> let's strike up the band is it time to do my dance yeah <laughs> yes please wait, do wait for dance. it wait for it okay i will i will there it is <laughs> all right <laughs> All right. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, you guys. Have a great weekend. Have a great weekend. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye.